Okay, team, final week. We're almost there, you're almost done, and then you guys can mostly relax. You'll have the exam coming up, uh, but you'll be done having to listen to my lectures. Um, uh, today we're gonna go through two topics. We're gonna talk about foundations, because all of this, our whole building has been doing all of these things, and then where do the loads go? Well, ultimately, we want them to get into the ground. And that happens, we have to transfer the load from the building into our foundations, and then our foundations transfer that into the soil. And then the other major building component that we haven't talked about much, but you've heard me kind of touch on throughout the term, is a lateral load resisting system. So we'll talk about uh, both of those today. We're not, it's not gonna be heavy on calculations. There's one or two small calculations that we're gonna do that make great exam questions, but mostly we're going to talk about uh, what the construction methods look like and how they behave. So let's start with foundations. So the role of the foundation, it's to transfer the building loads to the ground. So we have all of this stuff happening in the building and we need to get it out into the soil, ultimately. So we have downward loads, our vertical loads. We have shear loads, so the building sliding along the ground. But if that shear load is raised up, we have a tipping action happening on our building where our building wants to tip over. So the burden of the foundation, well, obviously we don't want it to fail. Uh, we need it not to experience unreasonable amounts of settlement. So this would be uh, two different things we worry about. So there's the total settlement of the building, which has a particular criteria, and then there's differential settlement. You can imagine um, if you've ever, I'm trying to think what thing you might have made that would be a good example. Uh, Play-Doh, Play-Doh is a good example. So if you've ever uh, played with Play-Doh, if you've let it sit out just a little bit too long, some parts of the Play-Doh are maybe a little bit stiffer than others. And remember, stiffness attracts load, um, uh, but if there's nothing that forces these things to move together, you could have differential strain. And so differential movement can cause cracking in the building, and we really don't want to have that happen. And we need our foundations to prevent the building from heaving. So what heaving is, is when water gets underneath our foundation and freezes. And we all know that water expands when it freezes, and as it expands, it can actually heave things up. Usually not the building as a whole, but it can. But often um, uh, slabs and elements, small elements within the building or exterior elements um, are very susceptible to heave and cracking due to, uh, due to frost penetration. So to prevent that, our foundations must go down four feet in Toronto or be frost protected in some way. So uh, it varies across Canada. And so for example, in um, Florida, they don't really experience frost. So we, uh, this value is zero. And because we have to go down four feet for frost, we're already digging a four foot hole in the ground. Often we say, eh, might as well go down a few more feet and get a basement out of it. All right. So what is settlement? I said we need the building not to settle. So what causes this settlement in a building? Well, all of this is ultimately sitting on dirt, soil of some sort. Maybe it's bedrock. There we've got some pretty solid things to connect to. But what if it's sand or dirt? So if this is what our, set, our, our grains in our uh, soil look like, as you put load on it, they could shift a little bit and end up looking like that. Anyone who bakes, you know, if you take flour, and bang it, what seems like a very full cup of flour can shrink down. We can get settlement due to depletion of moisture. So as that moisture disappears, those elements get closer and closer together. And we can get settlement due to the migration of fine particles. So if there's water flow underneath something, we can have all of these fine particles wash away and the big particles then collapse. This is what often happens in the winter um, for water main breaks where you get sinkholes. So the water main breaks and water flows out, it washes away all the particles, and then we end up with settlement, usually quite catastrophic and large scale settlements. So what's differential settlement? So if we have slightly different soil 
in these two conditions, um, we can end up with differential settlement. So this is gonna settle some and this is gonna settle some. It happens, it will automatically have settlement. We need to know how much is allowable or under what loads will there be settlement. And then we limit the differential settlement as well. Uh, so if we need to do that, we can maintain low bearing stresses, we can proportion footings for equal bearing capacities, or, and this one's key, we bear footings on the same soil type. So that's often what we'll do. So sometimes a footing over here might need to come down a little bit deeper because our soil actually goes like this. I wonder if So if our soil looked something like that, our good soil, maybe we'd want to build our two footings in those locations instead. So how does soil fail? This is a question we get asked all the time. I'm worried that I have a funny lag going that happens when I use my screen, which is why I don't. Hold on, I'm gonna start and stop recording again. Stop and start recording again. Okay, that is still causing a funny lag. I hope it's not causing it for you guys, but uh, you're hearing my voice, uh, which is more than you might get in other situations. So I don't know what's going on. I can see it happening on my screen. There is a lag there, but I can't do much about it. Okay, soil failure. So if we have a heavy load coming down on the soil, the way soil fails is that it shears out away from under the, uh, the footing or the element that's putting the load on the ground. So we end up with shearing planes that look something like that. It doesn't happen often. It's usually not the normal failure mode simply because we build in a lot of factors of safety into the design of our foundations. So let's talk about how we know what to design our footings for. So foundation work and soil work is a separate trade or a separate consultant from the building engineer. The geotechnical engineers um, often do a geotechnical in investigation. So we, as the consulting team, are not allowed to hire them. So my, my insurance indicates that I am not allowed to hire the geotechnical engineer. Your insurance as the architect indicates you're not allowed to hire the geotechnical engineer. The owner has to hire the geotechnical engineer directly and tell them what information they need. But our owners don't. No, that's the reason they're hiring us. They don't know anything about this process. Most of them, it's their first time ever being involved in a building. Not always, obviously there's developers and uh, other conditions where they know a whole lot, but often the owner doesn't know what to ask for. So we as the consulting team will write a, uh, a terms of reference on the owner's behalf to issue to the geotechnical companies to get bids. So we would say, okay, we need test pits dug in certain locations and we need some boreholes, which is really just a hole that they bore down into the ground and pull out the soil and test it. Um, or we might say auger boreholes or percussion boring. So those are often either where they actually screw down and pull up soil, or they might um, use like a hydro system, water pressure to bring it up. Then the geotechnical engineer goes to the site, does those things, and then they write a report. And they come back to us as the consulting team and say, okay, here is the strength of your soil or the bearing capacity of your soil for strength. Here is the bearing capacity of your soil for settlement. Remember in our beam design, we were worried about shear and bending and we were worried about deflection. Here they're saying we're worried about strength and settlement. Hold on, I'm a little bit cold. I'm gonna grab my trusty blanket here. <clears throat> okay, the other thing that is critical from the geotechnical report is earthquake criteria. And we're gonna talk more about that in uh, lateral load resisting systems, 
but the way the load gets transferred to a building in an earthquake is through the soil. It is the soil that's moving and the building is going along for the ride. Different types of soil translate that movement in different ways. So you can imagine as the soil is kind of moving around, our building is sitting on it. And if the soil moves differently, our building will move differently. So knowing the earthquake criteria of the soil is critical. They'll also tell us the depth required for both bearing of the strength and settlement and also for frost. So we might need to go down four feet for frost, but we might in some locations only need to go down two feet for bearing. If so, we have to go down for frost if it's not protected, but there might be spots where we need to go down 10 feet for bearing. And then they'll often give recommendations for different types of foundation construction because different types of soil might lend themselves well to different construction methods. And I'm going to talk about some of those construction methods in a minute. They might also indicate if engineered fill is a better choice. So remember here when I said depth required, there might be spots where we need to go down 10 feet, maybe 15 feet or 20 feet. Um, sometimes what they might suggest is that we remove the top chunk of soil from the site and put back good engineered soil that allows us to keep our foundations at a higher elevation. So if you can believe it, taking away all that soil might be cheaper and then taking away all that soil, putting back new soil and having shallower foundations might be cheaper than digging down that deep for and then trying to build foundations that are that big. All right, let's look at some of the bearing capacities that uh, a geotechnical report might give us. So here are some maximum al allowable bearing pressures. So we have um, for dense or compact sand or gravel, 150 kPa. Uh, let's look down here, soft clay, 40 kPa. That seems like a big difference. And then sound rock, 500 kPa. So there is a wide difference in soil capacities that we can't even know uh, without somebody going and digging some holes in that ground to tell us what soil is there. Often what happens um, early in a project before we've engaged a geotechnical engineer, we might reach out and ask a firm if they've done a project nearby, or maybe the engineer or the architect has done a project you know, within that block of uh, our new building. So sometimes we might be able to start off with some early information that allows us to get going. Some projects are so small that they don't want to pay for a geotechnical engineer. Now, always in foundation construction, a building department will demand that a geotechnical engineer comes and looks at the soil that you're building your foundation on and see if it has uh, an appropriate capacity. What we'll often do in those situations is uh, not get a geotechnical engineer, assume something like 75 kPa, unless we know it's somewhere kind of like um, down at uh, the waterfront, for example, where we'll, we'll make a different set of assumptions. But if it's kind of normal Toronto-esque stuff, for example, we would probably start with 75 kPa, but warn the owner that when the geotechnical engineer comes and does their site inspection prior to construction, they might be in for surprise that their foundations need to get bigger. And that would all be done to help prevent them having to pay for a geotechnical investigation in the very early stages of the project. So there's a risk taken on by the owner there. So to achieve the bearing capacity we need, the soil must be undisturbed. So that means it can't have been dug up there before. If it has, it ha there are a sequence of steps that need to be taken to make that soil um, the equivalent of undisturbed. It basically our engineered fill. There can be no organic materials. Organics are bad, bad, bad for settlement. Um, organics have a tendency to decompose um, and change the bear and change the kind of density of the soil in those locations. So as they decompose, they leave a void, um, uh, meaning we can get large settlement. And the excavations need to be cleaned by hand. 
What that means is that um, if we're putting a footing on some soil, that can't have like chunks of rock. It needs to be kind of just swept away. It needs to be somewhat firm and swept away. This used to be a big deal when we were digging um, uh, kind of really large caissons that went down like 20 meters or something like that. Um, it was expected that a person had to go down there to review it. Um, so we often, even if we didn't need them that big, we needed to make them big enough that a person could safely go down there. Um, some of those rules have changed for uh, deep caissons, for example, like we can um, not count on end bearing. And you'll see what I mean in some of those slides in a minute. So what are some of the types of foundations? Well, here in Southern Ontario, and I'd say probably 80 to 90% of the population of Canada and in the States, uh, the typical foundation type or the most normal ubiquitous foundation type is a spread footing. And we have two types of spread footings. We have a strip footing, which just means it's a spread footing under a wall or a pad footing, which just means it's a spread footing under a column. We will often call uh, a, a spread footing under a wall a strip footing and a pad footing a spread footing. Even though we'll, we'll kind of we'll kind of toss these three terms around, spread footing, strip footing, pad footing. We know they're all the same thing, just maybe in slightly different configurations. What we're saying there is if we have a load, we're spreading it out over an area on the soil. So what does that look like? Well, what we're saying is the bearing capacity of our soil must be greater than the bearing pressure we're exerting on it. So remember, that little r means it's a reduced capacity. That little f means it's a factored load. Well, bearing capacity and bearing pressure, you remember pressure? Pressure, stress, we've talked about that formula before. We know that pressure or stress is stress equals force divided by area. So our bf is the same as our pf divided by our area. So our load over an area is our BF. So we know PF is our factored load that's acting downwards, and A is the area of our bearing. So this is, instead of just a stress uh, uh, symbol there, we're calling it our factored bearing pressure. So let's do, these are the only calculations that we're going to do today. Um, and again, they make great exam questions because they're uh, a quick one that allows us to do uh, a, a testable question. Because there is a mandate that I have to give you math questions. All right. I'm worried my camera is on the verge of... Let's get rid of our funny shadow there. Yeah, my camera is on the verge of falling out of its screw hole here. So let's see if we can keep this from wobbling too much. All right, I'll bring my calculation pad here. So let's take a look at the question. A column with a total load of a thousand kilonewtons sits on a spread footing bearing on till. Assume that a square footing of dimension D by D will be used. What is the minimum dimension D that can be used? I am going to go in and indicate that that is BF. So on slide, or that's PF. Slide 11, PF equals 1,000 kilonewtons. So they didn't say it explicitly here. I'm going to go in and update that for you so that you know that we're talking about a factored load. All right, let's take a look at this. I'll make me big here. All right, so we are saying that we have, I'm gonna draw a little diagram. We have a column of some sort. We don't know if it's steel or, or what, but we have a very poorly drawn square footing here. And coming down on this, we've been told that PF equals a thousand kilonewtons. We want to know the 
the dimension D. We don't know what that dimension is and that's what we want to know. So they told us that this is on, um, what soil did they tell us? Bearing on till. Okay, I'm gonna make me small here again. Let's go take a look at our list of soil types here. Um, sorry, I'm getting messages from everyone in town. All the kids are sick and it like happened since last night and going in today and we're a small community so everybody is panicking about going to get COVID tests and doing all the stuff that needs to be done. Uh, and my five-year-old is getting his COVID test or his COVID vaccine today. So whew, half the town is getting COVID vaccines for their littles and half the town is going to get COVID tests. And we're all trying to trade off cars and car seats and school pickups and... Okay, so they said till. All right, look at this. Till, 200 kPa. So it looks like we're gonna get to use the 200 kPa value here. Oop. Let me see, wrong spot here. Okay, so we're gonna use, they said our, uh, our soil is till. So we know that till BR equals 200 kPa. All right, and we know that Br has to be greater than Bf. Or if we did it perfectly, if we got this exactly right, Br could be exactly equal to Bf. Br can't be less than Bf, but it could be exactly equal to it. So let's take a look. Br equals Bf as our absolute upper bound which means BR, and we know that BF equals PF divided by A. So BR equals PF divided by A. We don't know what A is, but we know what BR is, and we know what PF is. A equals PF divided by BR, or thousand kilonewtons divided by 200 kPa. Remember kPa is kilonewtons per meter squared, meaning whatever answer we get is going to be in meters squared. Let's take a look here. Is my calculator going to work? No. Okay. All right, so we've got a thousand divided by 200 equals 5 meters squared. Great, we have an answer. The area of this needs to be 5 meters squared. Except that that's not what they asked us. They asked us what dimension our square footing needed to be. So they want to know what this is. Well, our area equals d times d, or d squared. We want to know what our area is. So D is going to be the square root of our area. So let's, let me get us to, let me get this to the calculator here. I'll turn it here. All right, we want, it's very hard because this is lit, um, the square root of five equals 2.236 meters. Great, we know that we need a footing that is 2.236 uh, meters by 2.236 meters, which is great, except that we know that when they're forming concrete, they usually tend to do it in uh, 50 millimeter increments. We don't want it to be smaller than this dimension or else we'd have a smaller footing than a five meter squared footing. So if we want to round this to a nice, even buildable number, we'd round this up. So we'd use a D of 2.25 meters. Let's just double check that. Let's just see, let's just see what BF is 
for uh, a 2.25 meters squared. Let's just double check this. Let's just make sure that our BF is in fact less than 200 kPa here. So let's, we have 1000 divided by 2.25 divided by 2.25 we have a BF of 197.5 kPa. Yes, it is less than 200 kPa. So it seems like that's a really good footing to use for this, uh, this condition. All right, so here it is, slowly coming up. Okay. A wall with a total load of 20 kilonewtons per meter sits on a strip footing with a width B bearing on loose sand. What minimum dimension is needed for B? So first off, let's go right now before I make the screen big, let's go look at the BR for loose sand. All right, loose sand or gravel. We're gonna be using 50 kPa, so four, four times less than the till. All right, or a quarter of the till, okay. Let's get back to this one, okay. Let's make me big again. All right, so what we're saying now is that we have a wall of some unknown length and it is sitting on Footing. Let's we're gonna cut it off here. So it is sitting on a footing that looks like this, and we want to know how wide how wide this footing needs to be. And we they have told us that here I'm gonna draw this as an applied load here. Coming down on this wall is a uh, WF of 20 kilonewtons per meter. So every meter length of this wall is seeing 20 kilonewtons. So here's a hot tip. Here's how I do this. Well, rather than try to figure out how long my wall is and multiply it by the 20 kilonewtons, I just say, I'm going to think about this wall as being one meter long. So knowing that I have multiple lengths of this wall, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna look at one meter length of it, which is convenient because then if I have one meter of wall, this is the same as saying I have a PF of 20 kilonewtons because I multiplied this by the one meter of wall that I'm talking about. So that is a thing that makes this calculation one step easier. They said our BR was 50 kPa. We want a BR that is greater than BF. We know that BF is PF divided by area. So our BR, if we, want it, if we want to take it right to the limit of what works, we're saying BR is equal to BF or PF divided by A. We know what PF is and we know what A is. We know what BR is. Well, we kind of know what A is. A is what we're looking for. So BR we know is 50 and PF we know is 20 and we know that A is B times one meter, because that's the area of the underside of this footing. We can rearrange this and bring uh, this up here and this down here. We're saying B equals 20 divided by 50 times one, or B equals B equals 20 divided by 50, 
and divide it by 1, or 0 0.4 meters. That's already a nice even increment. So I would say I need a wall that is 400 millimeters wide. Well, I would indicate if you were looking, if I was looking for an answer in meters or millimeters, or it would be a multiple choice question. But, you know, a 400 millimeter wide footing is great. So that is literally the complexity of the calculations we're going to do today. We're not going to go anything deeper than that. So here it is worked out. So therefore we need a footing that is at least 400 millimeters wide. Okay, let's come back up to me here. All right. Okay. That's not great. Nor is that. All right, that's something usable. Okay, so uh, excavations. We say that you can dig straight down in the soil for four feet, but uh, anything more than that, you need a seven to 10 slope. We don't want the sand to kind of, or the soil to slough into the hole. So this would be a typical excavation. You can imagine for a building that has uh, like a 10 meter deep uh, base here, we can have four feet or 1.2 meters of straight excavation, but the remainder of it, as much as we go down, we have to go even further to the side. So you'd end up with a very, very, very large excavation pit, much larger than the size of the building you're building. Um, that can be really prob problematic. Um, uh, that can be really problematic if you're trying to build something in the city, for example, um, because you've got other buildings right next door. And so there are ways to deal with that, and I'll show you those in a few minutes. Uh, how thick do we make our spread footing? Well, um, there are in-depth compl complicated calculations we can do for that. But often, kind of a pretty good rule of thumb is make the projection equal to the thickness. So that wall we just did, that footing said it needed to be 400 millimeters wide. Um, uh, actually, that one's not a great example because it's gonna say we need a much thinner uh, footing than we need to. So a 200 millimeter footing would be minimum. The one we just did, we got that it needed to be 400 millimeters wide. Uh, typically our wall would probably be something around 200 millimeters, leaving a 100 millimeter projection on each side, saying this only needed to be 100 millimeters deep. But I've added the note here that it should be at least 200 millimeters thick. Stepped footing. We do a stepped footing where um, we need to transition from a deep zone, from a shallow zone to a deep zone. We can't just do a straight uh, change in elevation there because this load creates a surcharge on this part of the foundation. So we gradually switch in our depths of footings. And so here's kind of the guideline on how we do that. If you guys remember in those images I showed you way back at the beginning of the term, I showed you in plan where we would have some stepped footings. Caissons or drilled piles. So uh, this is something that we would often use where we have um, crappy soil near the top of uh, uh, our soil layers or where we have very, very, very heavy soil loads. So caissons are literally where we dig away the soil and cast something or put something in. Usually these are concrete. So we'll um, dig away the soil and put in a liner and reinforcing and then fill it all up with concrete. The great thing about a caisson is we get to use some of the side friction against the soil here as part of our load resisting. And some of it goes to end bearing. And remember I said that sometimes now we'll get rid of that clause for having someone go down here and inspect the bottom of the caisson. 
Because as these get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, more of the load is resolved through the friction and maybe we can just ignore this component and we can say, great, we don't even need to worry about end bearing. It's all going out in side friction. So we're not gonna make some poor person go down there and look at the bottom of this caisson. Bell caissons. So bell caissons are where we dig down and then make the area of bearing just a little bit larger. I said in the last slide that we can use side friction. What happens when the soil for like the first 10 meters is really crappy? Obviously, we don't really get to use that side friction the same way. Um, so in some locations, what we rely on is a belled caisson. I have never, well, I had never designed a bell caisson simply because <clears throat> To uh, get this bigger element here, you either have to dig the entire shaft at that depth, at that width or that size. Otherwise, how are you digging away the soil underneath there? Or you need a special machine that goes down in a narrow shaft and then at the bottom has a thing that can widen out and dig away that soil. Here in Ontario, um, we often, if we're using caissons, it's often because we've got bad soil and we're going down quite deep anyway. And so uh, once we're going down, we're getting down into good soil and we don't need to use belled caissons. And we don't use caissons all that often here. We might use them kind of down on the waterfront where we're in, um, uh, where all of the land didn't exist a hundred years ago. It's all been built up from when we built the subway and all of the uh, deep foundations for all of the high-rise buildings that are in the city. So basically anything south of Front Street is fake land. We made that. We built that land that didn't exist before. That was water previously. Um, some some kind of building companies sell uh, their Bigfoot uh, caissons where they basically sit on the end of a sauna tube. Those are great where uh, you're kind of digging shallow foundations anyway, but it saves you on some concrete. So there we take uh, like a concrete tube and fit it into a bell. Um, and we're only digging down four feet often for those. So, you know, them making a bigger excavation isn't a big deal. Where I ran into this, um, was in Edmonton. In Edmonton, their frost requirement is I believe they have to go down 12 feet um, uh, for frost, meaning that they don't want to build basements that go down 12 feet. The cost associated with that is huge. So what they'll often do is not do a basement. They'll go down 12 feet for uh, their loading and then they'll do um, grade beams and some combination of frost protection at a shallower level. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. But because caissons are ubiquitous there, they have the fancy machines that dig out that bell at the bottom of the caisson. We don't have them here. I think there's like one or two machines that can do that here in Southern Ontario. But in Edmonton, that is the way they build their footing. So it was very easy to do a belled footing there. So knowing your location is very important on what construction method you do, which is why those soils reports are very important because the, um, the geotechnical engineer will give you really great feedback on what should be done in that region. So a good relationship with the geotechnical engineer is always important. Piles. Uh, these get driven into the ground. So literally we take an element and we start to put it in the soil and we drop heavy weights on it and bang it down into the ground. There's lots of vibration associated with those, um, uh, but they're very handy uh, because we're not digging anything away. We are literally driving these into the ground. You can do clustered uh, piles or clustered caissons as well. Caissons are a little bit harder because they end up closer, there's requirements on how far apart they need to be. Uh, the piles can be a little bit closer together um, or we might use helical piers, which is a slide I'll show you in a minute. But if we have 
large loads, what we might do is a series of these and then tie them all together with a concrete cap at the top. So imagine this being like our spread footing sitting on top of these piles that transfer our load down to good soil. So engineered fill, I talked about why would we do engineered fill or what is engineered fill? So this is something we might do where our good soil is really far down. So really, really, really far down and we don't wanna have to dig these deep foundations and fill it up with formed concrete. Now, I know you're thinking, how could taking away a whole site of this soil and bringing back new soil be cheaper than these going down with these foundations? Well, often um, uh, we might have um, uh, the construction of this concrete is so expensive compared to just trucking away soil and putting in new soil. Uh, or we might have a lot of construction. If this was, um, I've seen this a lot for community centers where we have uh, higher requirements than normal uh, for our rink slabs and our pools. And so just rather than locally trying to dig things away and replace the soil, it's cheaper to take all the site's soil away, come in with new soil at the level we want it, and then just start building our building. It kind of takes away a huge amount of coordination. Um, and this is this part is relatively easy work. In fact, where I live right now in Port Hope, um, all of the soil where there's lo large locations in town where there is um, uh, contaminated soil, because in the 50s and 60s, the, um, the uranium um, purification plant uh, that's in town um, had all kinds of leftover uh, fill after the extraction process and they just gave it away to the town to use for construction. Um, so there is, that company was bought by the government, the federal government in the uh, 60s, I believe. Um, and so now there's a program where they're taking away all the contaminated soil and bringing back new, good, clean soil. That part isn't the hard part. The hard part is all the buildings that were built in or around that bad soil. So I will say that my property is one of the most contaminated properties in Port Hope. And sometime in the next year or so, uh, my uh, half an acre or two third or one third of an acre uh the top four to six feet of soil on my entire property is being uh carted away and replaced with good soil but it also means every tree and every plant and every bit of landscaping and every bit of everything we've ever done here is going to be destroyed as well so there's a kind of a huge uh, uh kind of play of what is what is worth it and what isn't um all right, trench footing. What can we do if um, we don't want to cart away all that soil? So maybe we don't have a maybe we don't have a community center going on there. Um, so I've had this happen um, on a project recently where uh, we needed engineered fill, but we only had some footings like kind of around the perimeter of this building. Um, and so what we did there was we trenched down to the depth of bad footing filled it up with engineered fill, and then put our footing on that good soil. Rather than bring our footing all the way down to here, we didn't have a basement in this building. We only needed our footing to go down four feet for frost, uh, but the good soil was down 12 feet. So we recommended a trenched solution with some temporary shoring, uh, and they ended up doing that method. Helical piers, if you've ever tried to assemble Ikea furniture where you have to screw the screw into that pressed kind of um, crappy press board wood, you know that it, usually it's an Allen key. As you're trying to turn that Allen key, it gets harder and harder and harder and harder to turn. That is the concept of our helical piers. We actually screw into the ground until it gets too hard to screw anymore or to the point that we know that that torquing is associated with a certain soil resistance pushing up. 
And so again, we can do these locally or in a cluster. What's great about these is they're small and they're quick to install. The downside with these is their proprietary uh, application. And so they will say, and there is the fact that we don't know what the actual resistance is until they're being screwed in. They can make good estimates, but there is a small amount of risk associated with using this method. We might predict that they need uh, 20, but they might in fact only need 16, or they might need 100. Usually they're very, very good at predicting within a very small margin um, of what they need, but there is a risk associated with it. A map foundation. We might say in bad soil locations that will go down, but we'll distribute the load over the entire area and then plop our building on top of it. Um, the Tommy Thompson Park Pavilion uh, I did that kind of opened this summer for DTAH uh, has a mat foundation. That is uh, at Tommy Thompson Park, which is 100% um, a built section of land. It was literally all of the concrete and debris dumped there and then some token soil thrown on top of it. And it has turned into kind of an eco an amazing ecosystem kind of down there on the waterfront. And so this building was built on very, very, very poor soil. Uh, and so what we did is we distributed the entire load of the building over a huge area uh, on a mat foundation that was down some amount. So the whole building has a footing underneath it. Timber cribs. This is often how we will build in water, especially for small scale construction. If anyone has been to a cottage in, in Ontario, you have probably seen a timber crib as the dock construction. I have spent a lot of time rebuilding cribs due to ice movement. So a slab on grade. So a slab on grade is um, kind of that last little bit of, of that, that last floor of your building that sits right on the dirt. So we'll have our foundations, but we often infill it with something and that would usually be the slab on grade. Um, it's usually for an interior application and it's cast on a layer of clear crushed stone, which is in turn on native soil. We need it to be able to support 24 KPA. Again, this is a fantastic, easy quiz exam question. What what bearing capacity do we need for a slab on grade? 24 kPa. Remember, our footings were often on, you know, 50, 75, 100, 150 to 200, but our slab on grade only needs to be around 24 kPa, unless there are unusual things happening in that building. So frost voids and heaving. So you can see here's a good example of a ground heaving or when it heaves and then uh, it moves all of the soil away and then when the soil melts or the ice melts, it can create a void. Insulated slabs on grades or footings. So our going down for frost is about keeping the cold air away from our building. If we have an uninsulated slab going down four feet for frost at the perimeter doesn't do anything for us because we can get our frost penetration through our slab. In those examples, we would want to have insulation under the system to pr protect the frost from either coming down through the slab and freezing this soil and causing it to heave or coming down through and around and causing it to heave. Insulated foundations, we've seen this evolve uh, over the past few years. When we started putting it on the drawings, it was a fight every time with the building department. Now it is an acknowledged, accepted uh, alternative to protecting for frost. So what we can do is rather, assuming this is a heated, protected space, rather than go down four feet for frost, we can come down two feet for frost or some amount for frost and go out this way to make up the remainder of our soil. What we're really saying when our frost penetration is four feet, 
we're saying our frost can move from the surface up to four feet. So in this case, it can go down two feet and over two feet, but it would never make it to here because it can't come down and penetrate this. So we need this sum of, of dimensions to be at least four feet in Southern Ontario. Another alternative or a thing we'll often do is a frost slab. A frost slab is something we do to protect our doors of our buildings. So this really started to evolve when we started understanding the importance of barrier free access. And this is a thing I'm, I'm good friends with Luke Anderson who started Stopgap. Um, he worked at Blackwell and he was working at Blackwell when he created Stopgap, which has turned into such an amazing um, uh, uh, kind of um, charity organization. So most of you have probably seen a Stopgap ramp outside of the businesses in downtown Toronto. What used to happen at doorways was the, the, the door was raised some amount relative to the ground. So there would have been a step here. Now we know that that is absolutely horrible for anyone trying to move around with disabilities or in a wheelchair. And as a mom, oh my goodness, trying to get anywhere with a baby stroller is impossible. So we want this to be flush. The reasons we didn't used to make that flush is you can imagine if we get um, a settlement well, if we had a buffer there, no big deal. The bigger thing was frost heave. So if this was just an outdoor sidewalk, we would let it heave and keep it down below the door and there was no big deal. We would just let it go up and down with frost. If we want this flush, but we don't protect this outdoor slab for frost, it could heave and then we have an issue where a door can't open. So we need to protect this bit of slab here from frost for at least usually our door swing. Um, and then there's usually a, a method of transition between these of, uh, for the architect on how that kind of gets resolved, that we allow a certain amount of protection over a certain distance that would account for slope that still allows kind of barrier-free access accommodations. But this is built flush at a doorway that is a means of egress um, uh, and then protected for frost to protect prevent heave, which could prevent our door from opening. Within our foundation group, we often have retaining structures as kind of our last topic that we'd need to talk about. So retaining structures, we talked about retaining structures, I believe, uh, when we talked about um, uh, loads on our buildings. We looked at soil load on a foundation wall. Now a typical foundation wall has a slab here that stops the wall from moving sideways. So you can see this becomes our reaction. And we have a floor here that stops the top of our wall from moving, and that becomes our reaction. Most drawing sets have a clause that you cannot put in your backfill until your first floor is in place because it stops this wall from just tipping over. If we don't have a wall here, we have a retaining wall. And for a retaining wall, we need to think about resisting that wall from tipping over. And there are a few ways to do it. We can just make this wall massive enough that it wouldn't tip over. There's enough weight coming down right here that stops the wall from tipping over. We can do that same thing, but instead of just making it massive enough, we can put a footing down here that would be like, instead of just tipping over if you were standing up, you put some distance between your feet that stops you from tipping over. So this is like spreading your legs to resist the load of somebody pushing you over. Um, here is kind of a good image to show you an idea of uh, what things, there's, there's the next slide that has kind of some preliminary dimensions that you could use in a preliminary sizing. I often see 
when architects or landscape architects are drawing their preliminary retaining wall, they draw just a normal little strip footing here. And they're always surprised by how large this footing needs to be. So get your head around the fact that a retaining wall needs a large amount of footing underneath here. In fact, here are some preliminary proportions of what you could expect to see for a foundation wall or a retaining wall. You can make it massive by just making it a wedge. You could keep the wall small and make your footing big. And you can flip that dimension that's right here, either all to the back or all to the front, depending on where your property line is. If this is your property line and you're on the high side, you can bring your footing to this side. If this is your property line and you're on the low side, you can bring your footing all the way to this side. Often we have some combination of it um, and we might make our excavation just a little bit easier by doing this. We can do retaining walls uh, out of wood. What we do often with these wood ones is we will drive a certain amount of these wood elements back into the soil. This is often called a dead man. And what we're doing with a dead man is we're driving it back so that for this to tip over, it would have to lift up a bunch of soil to go with it. So we get to count this soil as a dead load pushing down as much as it is a load pushing sideways as well. We can do it with modular block retaining walls. These would be a proprietary system um, and every company kind of has a different system in place. Um, what we'll do sometimes is slope the wall to try to help with some of that load resisting as well. So here, you've probably all seen some of these on the side of a road or on the side of a highway. Or you've seen a gabion wall. Um, it doesn't need to be tilted like this. It can be, um, but we can either tilt it or not. There's calculations to do both. Um, and in fact, if you've seen the Tommy, Tom, Tommy Thompson Park Pavilion, which actually just won a concrete award last night that I unfortunately couldn't attend, um, we actually have a really beautiful gabion wall on a site in that project that DTH did a lovely job filling that gabion wall with in tiers of reclaimed material. It's quite beautiful. So what do we do in those conditions where we don't want to dig back at our 7 to 10? So if this is the low side we need, and this is the high side we need, but we're going down, I don't know, 10 meters because it's a high rise with three stories of basement. We can't excavate all the way back like this at a 7 to 10 slope because we've got another high rise building sitting right here. Well, what we do is we dig down four feet uh, and then we drive some piles. And in those piles, we then slide some wood panels in between them. So uh, this would be our, our, uh, our soldier pile. And then we would put lagging down in between it. So you can imagine you've got these at like eight feet on center and you slip a piece of wood in that's resisting the load in bending um, and each piece of wood is resisting a little bit of load and it slides down to the bottom. Then what we do is we dig down another four feet, slide all of those things down four feet and add four more feet in at the top. And we keep doing that in lifts until we get down to the depth we need. Okay, I'm gonna take a little break for me and then we're gonna jump into lateral load resisting systems. Okay, lateral load resisting systems. What the heck are they and what do they do? Before I even go any further, I want you to know that every single building in each direction on every floor needs a lateral load resisting system. The lateral load resisting system is the thing that stops it from tipping over. Everything needs a lateral load resisting system. Your deck needs a lateral load resisting system. A sign on the side of the highway needs a lateral load resisting system. It might be 
a very easy one. And those aren't necessarily the ones we're going to talk about. We're going to focus on a building. But every single building needs something on every floor in each direction to stop it from tipping over. So let's, oops, woo woo, here we go. Okay, what do lateral load, lateral load resisting systems do? If this is the side of my building, and this is, this is the ground, and this is the roof, and I have a building like this, maybe there's some other posts in here, but that's it. They're all just loosely connected with these. I could have these, more of these here, all built just like this. That does not have a lateral load resisting system. That wants to tip over. What we do is we will put, for example, a brace in our wall. So that has a lateral load resisting system. I can't push that over. The other thing we can do is if this is our, our wall, I've taken a piece of cardboard here, I've cut it to fit, now look at this. We have a lateral load resisting system. See, it wants to slide just a little bit. So it would become important to connect this into this and this into this. But once we do that, we now have a lateral load resisting system. So this is a shear wall. This is a brace. The other thing we can do is so here was this floppy one. If I hold these really tight, it can't tip over. If I did it for all of them, if I made this really sticky in some way, or if I put kind of little connections from here to here, so little triangles all around here, that would be a moment frame. And that could also be a lateral load resisting system. I'm gonna tell you, it's the crappiest of the lateral load resisting systems, but it has its place. There are times we can use a, a moment frame as our lateral load resisting system. The other thing, so this would be taking our wind load that's trying to tip it over, or our seismic load that's trying to move our ground around and make our building try to tip over. The other part of our lateral load resisting system is our floor. So imagine take our wall and tip it like this. If this is our floor, when we have earthquake loads or winds gusting, this side doesn't get the same amount of force as this side necessarily or at the exact same time. Our floor has a tendency to want to skew and go out of square. So our floor diaphragm is very similar to our shear wall, except now in plan, we've stopped this from trying to skew. Most of the time when we're talking about our lateral load resisting system, we're talking about our walls. But it is important to remember that our floor diaphragm is part of our lateral load resisting system as well. All right, here's just a little quick visual of what is happening in seismic loading. So this was in the summer with my boys uh, at the cottage and they're standing on one of these yellow mats. What Dave is gonna do is he's gonna move the mat and it is exactly like earthquake on the soil. Okay, so that is exactly how earthquake loads work on a building. Can anyone guess what they could have done? And I tried to get them to do this, but you know, for a two-year-old and a five-year-old to try to get them to do anything when they're excited swimming in the water is just beyond impossible. Uh, but what if I had told them to turn and face me instead and spread their legs? They probably, they might have still fallen over, but it would have been a lot harder to get them to fall over like that. 
And so that is part of what we're doing with our lateral load resisting system. We're trying to resist those loads to stop that tipping over to happen. I have create I haven't created. I found a really lovely video of someone who basically with popsicle sticks and string created these and they walk through it. Um, watch it if you want. You can you have access to this slideshow. You can copy and paste this exact link. Go check it out. Just if you're really having a hard time getting your head around it, it might be nice to see someone else talking about these lateral load resisting systems. Oops, oops, that went fast. All right, what are the jobs of the lateral load resisting system? Well, not to fail under the load, to prevent the building from deflecting excessively and to stop it from tipping over or sliding. You could imagine if we built this very, very stiff, but we didn't do anything great between it and the ground, the whole building could actually just slide. So there's a few things we're trying to do there with our lateral load resisting system. So what are the types of lateral load resisting systems? Well, we can have walls. Those are our shear walls that we put in our wall. Um, concrete makes a great shear wall. In fact, if you've got enough concrete walls, make them your shear walls, problem solved. Masonry can be a lateral load resisting system. We don't like to start with masonry, so don't jump right in there. You'll probably get pushback from an engineer now with the current codes, but it is something we can do. Wood, wood shear walls, plywood, make great lateral load resisting systems. So instead of just one of these this far apart, you can imagine we have these every 16 inches on center, because remember our wood studs are 16 inches on center, and then we're nailing plywood to it. So this is our plywood and these are our studs. That can create a fantastic shear wall. There are things we have to add to it, and I'll show you that in a few, pi in a, a few pictures down the road. A-frames or, or bracing, so we can have one diagonal brace. Um, often, remember that whole thing about buckling? So this is a nice robust element. If this was a piece of string, when I push this way, this would behave very well. But if I push this way, my string would buckle. So what we might do is one in each direction or cross bracing. An A-framed or a three-pinned arch. I don't have anything that shows that right here, but that's basically anytime you lean things against each other. That can be stable as long as you can resist the loads at the bottom. And then moment frames or portal frames can be uh, lateral load resisting systems as well. Like I said, they're the crappiest one of it. They are the least efficient, the most expensive, and have the most deflection, but sometimes they're the right answer. So what should you think about when you're picking your lateral load resisting system? Well, think of the industry standard for that building type. If I am building a concrete condo, I'm probably not gonna put steel bracing in it. I'm gonna use a concrete shear wall. Um, uh, flexibility, uh, what gives you the most options within your building. Um, for a steel building, uh, I'm probably gonna try to think about where my braces are that allows openings to happen really easily. What are the applied loads? Different types of loads might influence what lateral load resisting system we pick. And then think of your floor and roof system. If you're already building out of wood, it probably makes sense to build out of wood. So what are the common building types for, for lateral load resisting systems? So for each type of building, I've listed what are common lateral load resisting systems. Again, I love lists and my lists would come straight, like any, any quizzes or exam questions would come straight out of the lists. I wouldn't be trying to trick you with that. Um, uh, again, you can always do something different. This, this is key, common. I'm talking about the majority of the time, this is what we would do. So wood frame construction, perimeter wood shear walls. I'm talking about residential construction here or our, uh, no, our, our dimensional lumber or our normal two by construction type. Perimeter wood shear walls are the norm. 
Sometimes we might have a steel brace, sometimes we might use a concrete core, but most of the time it is going to be a wood stud shear wall. Hotels and condos are almost always concrete, so a concrete shear wall is going to be the common thing for them. Again, they might end up being a steel building, but they probably still have a concrete core. Schools, load-bearing masonry shear walls tend to be pretty common. Schools usually only tend to be two stories high, um, uh, and so we, we often, that's probably the last holdout of masonry construction that I've seen. Commercial buildings, concrete shear walls or tilt-up walls. Industrial buildings and warehouses, brace frames. Those are almost always built out of steel, and so we're going to do steel brace frames. High-rise office buildings. There's a few different options, and that's one of the places where we do mix and match materials somewhat. But there could be a concrete shear wall, concrete cores, or a concrete tube up the middle of the building. Steel bracing, or a combination of those. And then arenas are often moment frames or A-frames in the short direction. And then in the long direction, we would have X bracing down along the side. So what can't we do in Toronto because of seismic loads? I'm going to add that into this, that for slide 48. I'm going to stress that this is because of seismic conditioning. I always say to people, it's not an engineer's job to say no. It's our job to tell you what makes it possible, but let you know that it might not be very efficient. One of the few things that it is absolutely my job to say no is there are certain things you can and cannot do due to seismic loads. So in Toronto, we can't build weak stories. So what does a weak story mean? All right, I've got this big, beautiful shear wall that is very, very, very stiff. And this comes all the way down the building and it is sitting on top of this, um, uh, this braced frame on the bottom floor. This is a lot stronger than this. If this is more than 10% stronger than this, we can't do it. The reason that is a requirement is um, that we saw that happen a lot in Haiti with the, uh, the, the um, damage that happened there. Uh, also, a lot of our building types that we built have um, uh, kind of a normal construction calling coming all the way down and then that bottom floor is kind of the big entranceway. We only want columns, we want glass all the way around. It's the street view into our building. And all of the load comes down through the building. And then where we have the peak load is exactly where we start to take away a bunch of our materials. So they've made a clause that you can't have more than 10% difference um, as you go down the building. You can have stronger stories below, but you then can't have another weak story below it. You also can't have too much torsion. So say I've got this lovely stiff floor uh, and this is my floor plate and this is my lateral load resisting system in this direction. Well, right here, the load is coming in even to the side of my building and it wants to twist as well. This is nice and stiff, but up here isn't. The building tries to twist and as the building tries to twist, that is torsion. Often what we'll try to recommend to people is place their lateral load resisting system evenly around the perimeter of the building as much as possible. Again, that isn't a demand, it isn't a requirement, but we have to control torsion. So you might get recommendations on how to control that torsion. In high seismic zones, we cannot shift our lateral load resisting system. So that means so say we have our weaker one here and our stronger one here, so we've met that demand. What we can't do is shift it like this. So we can't have it shift in that direction. We also can't have it shift like this. So we can't have that weak link 
in either direction of shifting our lateral load resisting systems. So in places like BC and uh, Montreal and Northern Quebec, your lateral load resisting system has to be consistent throughout the building. In Toronto, we can move it around. As long as there's a method to transfer the load from over here to over here, we can do that. The last one is in high seismic zones, we can't ignore capacity design options. What that means is they want us to make use of ductility. Remember, ductility is when we yield and ductility also absorbs energy. And so in um, uh, high seismic zones, they say it doesn't matter how big, stiff and strong you make your system. We don't care. You have to build in a backup that allows the energy to dissipate. Um, one of the upsides with that is that we actually get to reduce the loads we design for because so much of it goes into the, the energy absorption, but the engineering is phenomenal that goes into that. So it is not a linear uh, input of design uh, uh, in the system. So kind of the engineering work that goes into a high seismic zone building is probably triple what we might do for seismic design here. So let's, let's now look at just a bunch of lateral load resisting systems. This is the easy part, you know, pause it, go get yourself a, a fresh coffee and some popcorn. Um, if you're watching this on a Friday night and you drink, go open yourself a beer, uh, but sit and relax. These are just some images of lateral load resisting systems. So some of these we've already seen in our different material sections. So this is incorporates steel and concrete and wood, and you've seen a lot of these already. So here's a steel uh, diagonal brace. This one has to be able to take tension and compression. If they all go in the same direction here, it's got to be able to work for loads in this direction, but also in loads for this direction. So this element has to be able to take tension and compression. Here's just some detailing at a base for our brace coming into steel. Here's a diagonal tension compression brace as well as a connection. Here are ones that look like they're tension only. These look like really long slender elements and you see how they go in both directions. My guess is, is that this one works for load in that, well, I'm for me it's the opposite direction and loads for that direction for you guys or loads in that direction and this one works for loads in that direction. Uh, here's an eccentric diagonal brace detail. Often, this can be used as part of that capacity design. They'll often build um, ductile links and fuses for these elements that allow this, imagine it almost like a spring. It makes more movement in the building, but we've dissipated energy there, meaning that the actual design forces decrease. Here are uh, tension, com tension only uh, angle braces. So this looks like a very large industrial building. Uh, tension only uh, channels. Tension only bracing rods. This looks like it's either an arena um, or uh, an industrial building. Uh, X bracing tension only with rods. And here's X bracing rods in a tower. Again, I think you've seen every single one of these pictures already. All right, some unusual diagonal bracing. We can start to do kooky things. Now, you can see that this is stiffer than this. So maybe there's something somewhere else that's dealing with that, or maybe this was built prior to some of these seismic design codes coming into effect. Some K bracing, double chevron or K bracing. I don't get hung up on K or V or chevron. I don't care about the name of it. I just want bracing to be in there and it has to work for what we're trying to make it do. All right, super bracing. I like this one because from here to here, this is the brace. But on this floor right here, that's the brace. 
and that's the brace. And on this floor right here, those are the braces. Very, very, very heavy bracing. This one, by the time you factor in the gussets and the connections, it probably would have been easier to make this just a continuous panel. Because look, they had to weld all the way along here, all the way along here, all the way along here, all the way along here. But now they also had to do all of these welds. Had they just infilled that, maybe they would have saved themselves a ton of welding. We can do wood cross bracing. Again, our detailing difficulty becomes the steel at the connections, but that is possible. Again, an eccentric joint bracing. Sometimes this might be to relieve moment in something. Sometimes it might be about um, making it uh, uh, a ductile connection. And here's some bracing on a round building. Uh, I know I've said this before, but Dave and I always joke that you can uh, take your pain once or spread it out. It's like tearing off a band-aid. You can do it quick or you can do it slowly. So you can have big bracing in one spot or you can have a lot of little bracing. And here they really took the lots of little bracing to the extreme. Here's a really cool system. This is a 134 Peter right in downtown Toronto. And this is actually the building Dave works in. And my pals at Cast Connects designed these castings. So these are uh, basically a series of pyramids stacked on top of each other. And here is an A-frame. There's a pin here, a pin here, and a pin off of the page, and moment connections at those joints there. So we have two things like this, and they're propped up against each other. So they are stable. Uh, a steel moment frame. So you can see right now they even have temporary bracing in there, um, but you can see these members start to get really large. Look at how big those steel members are compared to some of the other ones, because this connection here is our moment connection. And then we have to deal with something down here at the foundation as well. Small steel moment frames. This looks like it's probably going in the back of a house or something. All right, wood shear walls. Here's one that was not designed properly as a wood shear wall. It was just designed as the gravity system. You can see that it pulled up here, it slid, which means it tipped off here, it broke at this panel right here, uh, and um, it crumpled this top cord. This right here is kind of like this shifting relative to each other. Like I said, this was just a quick thing I did by cutting out a piece of cardboard. The connections between the wood and, or the wood plywood and the studs becomes very important. So you can see here they've specified a lot of nailing at the perimeter of each piece of wood and they've specified um, nailing along each stud. You can see instead of having the pieces of plywood running this way, they've tipped them up that way. You can see that they've added a tie down here that gets cast into the concrete to stop that from trying to lift up. And instead of only having a few spots where it connects into the concrete for sliding, they've added quite a few more locations to prevent sliding. So this is what it takes to turn our gravity wood stud wall system into a wood shear wall system. It's actually not that much. The cost is relatively small as long as you let people know it needs to be done. Coming back and doing it later is expensive and hard. Telling people at the beginning it needs to be done is very cheap. So here's just what some of those tie downs look like. And I think I had shown you guys a picture of this previously as well. So some wood shear walls. You can see they've even marked off where the studs are. You can even sometimes buy pre-engineered systems for your wood shear walls. And you can see they've included all of the hardware and it comes as a panelized system. Wood, the diaphragm, is very highly specified. Steel deck, 
the steel deck guys really know what they're doing and as long as you put what those diaphragm forces are and same with hollow core concrete you almost just get it for free it's hard not to have a diaphragm that works for concrete um, but wood diaphragms we have to do a similar thing that we did for our wood shear walls we have to specify what direction our panels lay out how they nail out and what the nailing criteria is because you can see the load coming in there and we have to worry about the nailing patterns. Uh, these are braced corners. These are essentially making moment connections between this element and this element. You can see that this puts bending here and this puts bending here. This might be a wall where we need to do a lateral upgrade. So you can see, like I said, when I uh, do this, you can see this wants to slide here and here. Well, in this type of old school construction, this wants to slip at every single one of those planes. So sometimes they might come in and just put in a wood brace. Showing this again in the wood section. And I think I told you guys the story about this, Drew Mandel's house that had um, wood frames, uh, but it was such a narrow building and they couldn't take up any bracing anywhere so we did it with moment frames and they needed these uh, wood moment frames at eight inches on center and each connection which had one two three four five six connections needed like 20 of these expensive special screws so 20 uh, times uh, six for one single frame and then they had these frames every eight inches on center for the full length of the building um, and still drew understood that in extreme weather events there was more noticeable deflection so moment frames need more material they're less efficient so they're more expensive and they still result in higher deflections concrete walls if you got them use them Often concrete buildings are using the concrete walls as their gravity system uh, or your separation between zones and spaces. They become your acoustic separation. They become all of these things. Once they're there, you might as well make them your lateral load resisting system. So here you can see our concrete walls. Here's a concrete core going up in a building. So this may be a steel building uh, and that's the concrete core in it. Concrete portal frames. It's not a lot to see in concrete uh, lateral load resisting systems. They're walls with reinforcing in it. There's just not that much to see. So here are your takeaway tips. You should understand that settlement exists on buildings. You should be able to calculate the bearing capacity or the size of a footing needed for a spread footing, whether it's strip or pad. You should know what the bearing capacity of a slab on grade is. It's 20. You should know the depth required to prevent hot frost heave in Ontario. It's four feet below grade. You need to know that you need a lateral load resisting system in every direction, every floor, every building. I am going to make it the easiest question on your quiz and on your exam. I promise you that. And there are still people, and I can tell it's the people that didn't listen to the lecture, get that question wrong. It's easy. I usually give you the answer. It's in the question. I tell you what the answer is in the question. I've had people not believe me and make a different choice. I don't quite know what to do about that. Uh, and you should know what the typical lateral load resisting systems are. So that's the end of uh, ARC 281. It's been an absolute pleasure to have all of you as uh, students this year. I'm so sorry I haven't gotten to see you all in person. Hopefully a bunch of you will be moving on to the master's program and I'll see you then. Um, if not, uh, have a great time with the rest of your education. I'm gonna be in the building a bit more next term. If you see me, say hi. Uh, I won't know who you are. Uh, hopefully you'll know who I am. Um, you guys have been so great. Don't forget to fill out uh, the course evaluation forms. The point of those are to try to do anything we can to help make the course better. Um, I get to read your comments. So yes, it is anonymous 100%, um, but I do get to read the comments. Um, 
it isn't a place to, I mean, you can say whatever you want there. You, you can say, um, I don't like Shannon's haircut. You can say whatever you want, but that isn't something that's going to help make the course better. Um, obviously you can say you don't like math, but obviously there has to be math. So what I would love is if you think there is something that can be done to improve the course, let me know what it is because I do my best. Last year and even at the beginning of this term, there were comments about the microphone recording. So I went out and I bought a $200 microphone to try to make this better. So I've tried to implement a lot of things to try to do this better for you guys. Um, but if there's anything else you can think of, I, if I can implement it and it doesn't detract from the rest of the experience of people, I will do whatever I can to implement it. Uh, so um, have a great time. I'll be in touch prior to the exam uh, and I wish you all the best.